Hey guys, it's Tiffany. Today, we're gonna talk about the Pythagorean Theorem. Pythagorean Theorem. Some things to keep in mind. The Pythagorean Theorem states that the square of the hypotenuse of a right angle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. You will need to use a radical as the inverse operation for the exponents to solve for the answer. The formula used for the Pythagorean Theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In this triangle, I know I'm dealing with a right triangle because there's a square at one corner. That square is where the right angle is. That means that angle is exactly 90 degrees. Sides A and B are the two sides that are next to or adjacent to the 90 degree angle. Side C is the hypotenuse. It's diagonally across from where the right angle is. I like to think of the right angle box as sort of like pointing to the hypotenuse. This is what I mean when I say that. If this box were an arrow, in my mind, it's pointing to the line that's diagonally across from it with this corner right here, okay? It's saying, hey, the hypotenuse is over there across. So side A is called a leg, side B is called a leg, and the hypotenuse is side C. The hypotenuse is always the longest side of a right triangle. Let's take a look at example number one. For example number one, I have this right angle that has a leg of three, four, and our hypotenuse length is unknown, so it's just represented as C. I'm gonna start off by writing my formula. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now I'm gonna fill in everything and solve. My A and my B can be either leg. It doesn't matter which one. You don't have to say A is the smaller of the two legs or B is the larger of the two legs. It does not matter. It's going to work out correctly either way you do it. The C, however, always has to be the hypotenuse, which is always the longest length on the triangle. Let's plug in 3 and 4 into our formula. I'm gonna put three in for my A and remember to write squared. I'm gonna plug four in for my B and remember to write squared. And then that equals C squared. Now I'm gonna solve for the two numbers that are on the left side of the equal sign. Three squared equals nine. Four squared equals 16. And C squared is just brought down. Nine plus 16 equals 25. And that equals C squared. Now I need to get the C by itself on the right side or the left side of the equal sign. Well, right now it's already on the right side, so I don't really need to move it. I just really just need it by itself. What's over there with the C is the two. What I need to do is undo that. If you have not watched my simplifying radical expressions video, please go watch that video because right now I'm about to use a radical and need to understand how it works. In that video, I explain that when you're dealing with exponents, to undo an exponent, you need to use a radical. So just like when you were a little kid and you were first learning math, you learned that whenever you need to undo addition, you need to use subtraction. Right now, we have an exponent. So to undo our exponent, we need to use a radical. A radical is undoing an exponent. It's the inverse operation of an exponent. So right now, because I have a C squared, I need to undo that squared. I need to take, instead of the square of C, I need to take the square root of C, okay? So I'm gonna do that to both sides. The square root of C, and the reason I do it to the both sides is because if you remember, whenever you're doing inverse operations, whatever you do to one side, you must do to the other side. And then I would say square root over here, okay? Now, I'm gonna simplify this as much as I can. The square root of 25 is great because 25 is a perfect square. So that means I know that that turns into five times five. 
And whenever you're dealing with square roots, they're asking you to find groups of two that you can take out from under the radical. So when I have two fives next to each other, I know that I can take those out. And that just becomes the whole number five, okay? But as far as the right side of this equation, where I have the square root of C squared, I need to work on that. And if you remember, any number squared, it's like saying you have two of that number under the radical. So this is like saying I have C times C underneath the radical. So again, that's a group of two that I can take out. So that means I can take out just a regular C and the radical just falls off. So I know that C equals five. Even though it says five equals C, you can reverse it and it has the exact same value. So as far as this particular triangle, I have a leg length that is three, I have a leg length that is four, and I have my hypotenuse, which has a length of five. I had to calculate that using the Pythagorean theorem. So the length of my missing side is five. Before I go on to the next example, there's one thing I wanna point out about this particular example. And that is the fact that I did not put a plus or minus when writing my square root. A lot of times you've learned that two negative numbers being multiplied together is going to give you a positive number. And that is 100% true. So what that means is when you look at the problem right here, Technically, you could have broken your 25 down into the square root of negative five times negative five because negative five times negative five would give you 25. So when you were writing that radical, you actually could have put plus or minus, meaning positive fives would have worked or negative fives would have worked to give you the 25. Well, the thing is here, we are dealing with links and links can only be measured in a positive value. So although you could have a negative number there in theory, because we are dealing with measurements that are physical links, it has to be positive. So the negative factor does not apply when you're dealing with this type of problem, okay? Let's take a look at example number two. Example number two. I have another right triangle and I can see that again, it's my hypotenuse that is unknown. I know that because it's the only link that doesn't have a number, it has a letter. So the letter is a placeholder. It's telling us, hey, I don't know what this is. Instead of writing an actual number, I'm gonna write the letter C. A and B are my legs, which are the two shorter links, but I'm just gonna plug those into my formula anyway. So my formula is A squared, plus b squared equals c squared. Instead of a, I'm gonna write six this time. The first time I used the number that was um, vertically on the left for my a, but I wanna point out that it really doesn't matter. The a and b could be in either position. You're gonna get the same answer no matter where you put either one. So six squared plus eight squared equals c squared. C remains C because it's the only link that I don't know. Now I'm gonna multiply everything that I can. Six times six is 36. Eight times eight is 64. And that equals C squared. 36 plus 64 equals 100. And that equals C squared. Now I'm gonna take the square root of both sides because I want to undo my exponent over here. Whenever I wanna undo something, that's an exponent, I need to remember to use a radical, okay? Also, when we're dealing with solving an equation, I have to remember that whatever I do to one side of the equal sign, I have to do it to the other side of the equal sign. So I'm gonna take the square root on the right, and I'm gonna also take the square root on the left. Well, I'm gonna simplify my square root on the left because that's actually a pretty easy problem. The square root of 100 is nice because 100 is a perfect square. So this could be written as the square root of 10 times 10. And that means I have a group of 10s under the radical, so 10 can come out. Now, as far as the square root of C squared, that is the same thing as the square root of C times C. That means I have a group of Cs that can come out, and that means I have a C here. The radical just drops off. Now, I know that the length of this side C is 10, so I'm gonna write 10 over here. So. When I'm looking at my directions and it asks me to solve for the missing length, 
I know that when I use the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, I'm gonna get that c equals 10. Let's take a look at example number three. Example number three, it says solve for the missing link. This one would appear like it's gonna be nice and easy because we have a nice number like 10 and we have it twice. But let's see how it turns out. A and B are both gonna be 10 because both our legs have a value of 10. So let me start by rewriting my formula, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, 10 squared plus 10 squared equals c squared. 10 times 10 is 100, 10 times 10 is 100, and that equals c squared. 100 plus 100 is 200, and that equals c squared. Now, I'm gonna take the square root of both sides to get rid of this exponent of two. Square root over here, square root over here. Put my equal sign back down. Now, square root of 200. I'm gonna use prime factorization to figure out my prime factors of this so that I can figure out what I can take out. If you remember in the beginning, I said, oh, this will probably be a pretty easy problem because we have tens and that makes the problem seem like it's gonna have pretty easy work. But now that I have the square root of 200, I can see that this isn't a super, super smooth problem. I do have to kind of like still know some steps. Nothing's like canceling out nicely or anything. I still have to do a little work for it, okay? So 200, I need to get the prime factors. Let's see, I can say 10 times 20 gives me 200. As far as 10 goes, I could say two times five, and then I could say four times five, and I could break down four into two times two. And I could turn the square root of 200 into two times two times two times five times five. And remember, I'm looking for groups of two to take out. So I got a group of two here, and I got a group of two here. I can take a two out, and I'm gonna multiply that by the five that I can take out, and then I'm left with a two under the radical. Two times five is 10, and then that's square root two, okay? Now I need to deal with the radical that's on the right side. Remember that square root of c squared is the same thing as c times c, and that means I have a C that I can take out. So this becomes C by itself and the radical drops. So the answer to the link C isn't a nice neat number like you may guess when you look at this problem. The answer to the length of C is 10 square root two. That is in its most simplified form. Some people wanna put this in a calculator and calculate the square root of two, but you're gonna get a repeating decimal and it's not precise. There isn't an actual square root of two. That means there's not one number that I can multiply by itself to get to perfectly. So when you type the square root of two in a calculator, you're gonna get this long decimal that when you multiply it by itself, it gets a number that's very close to two, but it's not two. It'll be like 1.9999888 or something. Okay, so it's not precise when you do that. And not to mention, it's kind of like tedious. Who wants to write all those decimals? So if you want a more precise answer, even though it looks a little weird, 10 square root two is a better way. Now I do wanna point out something. Some people are probably like, Tiffany, why did you break down the 200 like that? You should know square roots well enough that you can like group them out without doing that. And some people do, but some people still might need a little help with square roots. So they might need that extra breaking down. But if you do understand how radicals work, you could have said, oh, well, I have the square root of 200. Well, how about I just take the square root of two times 100? I know that 100 is a perfect square, and so that means it's the same thing as 10 times 10, so I know that I can just take out a 10. So it turns into 10 square root of two because these two 10s were taken out, okay? So that's a little shorter. You might be able to see that. If you can do that, more power to you, do that, okay? I feel you, like skip those steps. But sometimes people don't understand every single step. So I try to break it down in case somebody still maybe doesn't get something in between there. But like I said before, I do have an entire video explaining how to do this. So if you're not sure how to do this, please go check out my Simplifying Radical Expressions video. Let's take a look at example number four. Example number four, we're gonna solve for this missing link, okay? Now, this time it looks a little different. 
if you notice the link that we are missing is not the hypotenuse it is not the c value or the longest side of the triangle it is the a value this time okay so we have to keep that in mind we're not going to be plugging in two numbers on the left side of the equal sign and leaving your c squared on the right this time we're going to have a number on the left a variable on the left and then your c is going to be on the right okay so let's start by rewriting our formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared okay a i don't know what it is so i'm just going to write a squared the b has to be the 15. i know that it has to be the 15 and not the 17 because it has to be one of the links that is right next to the 90 degree corner of the triangle okay so now i'm gonna put 15 squared in for b and as far as my c goes it's 17 squared all right now i'm gonna calculate these exponents and multiply the 15 by 15 and the 17 by 17 and simplify as much as i can a squared plus 15 times 15 is 225 and that equals 17 times 17 which is 289 now i need to solve for a meaning i need to get a on one side of the equal sign by itself right now over there with the a is the square the exponent next to it we're not going to touch that first and then there's also a plus 225. let's move the plus 225 okay remember whenever you're dealing with equations you have to use the inverse operation right now this problem adds 225, so the inverse operation would be to subtract 225. So minus 225. Now I have a squared equals 64, because 289 minus 225 gives you 64. Now I need to get rid of this exponent over here that's next to the a. So remember, to undo an exponent, we use a radical, okay? So I'm gonna take the square root to get rid of the square that's next to the a, but I gotta do that to both sides. Remember, an a squared under a radical is like the same thing as a times a, and that equals whatever this is gonna be. And the square root of 64 is a nice problem because 64 is a perfect square, and that equals eight times eight so that means a nice even eight can come out and the radical just drops away the same thing over here because we have double a's they can come out as a single a so the answer to the missing length is a equals eight or the length of the missing side is eight now let's take a look at example number five solve for the missing length this time b is our missing length okay Let's start by rewriting our formula. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. A has to be the seven because it has to be whatever is next to this 90 degree box, okay? So seven squared plus B, I'm gonna write that as the letter B because I don't have a value for it. And that equals C squared, which is 20 squared. Now I'm gonna solve this as much as I can. I have 7 times 7, which is 49, plus b squared, and that equals 400, because 20 times 20 is 400. Now, I'm going to subtract 49 from both sides. I'm left with b squared over here. This cancels out. The 49 minus 49 equals 0. So now I'm left with b squared equals whatever 400 minus 49 is and that is 351. now i need to take the square root of both sides because that's what's going to undo my exponent of two so a square root over here square root over here i'm left with b equals whatever this is how do i solve that I need to calculate the prime factors of 351. Well, you might be thinking, what in the world are the prime factors of 351 and how would I know it? Because this is kind of a weird looking number. It's not like ending in zero or even, like how do I know what's gonna go in it? Well, hopefully you remember your divisibility rules, but if you don't, I'll refresh your memory. 
I know that three can go into this number very easily just by looking at it because I remember the divisibility rules for three say that if three can go into the sum of the digits, then three can go into it. So what I mean is three right here plus the five plus the one equals nine and three can go into nine evenly. And because it can go into nine evenly, that means it can go into this whole number evenly. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Now I'm gonna use that rule to let me know that I can break this down into three times something. I don't know what the other part is, but at least I know three can go into it. Well, if you don't know, you can divide and you're gonna get 117. And then you're looking at 117 and you're probably like, well, how in the world am I supposed to know what goes into that? And again, I would say, because you need to know your divisibility rules. And I'm looking at it again and I can add all these up and I can see that three goes into this again because seven plus one plus one is nine again. So three goes into nine. So I know three goes into this. So now I can break it down again. And that's three times 39. That gives me 117. Same thing again. Three plus nine is a number that's divisible by three. It's 12, okay? So I know three can go into this again. Now I can break that down into three times 13, okay? Now I'm looking at all of these in numbers and I can see that they're all prime, okay? I have three, 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 and 13. So I could rewrite this radical but with those four numbers underneath it, okay? So that would look like this. The square root of three times three times three times 13. And I can pull out a group of threes and I can't pull out anything with those. So B equals three times the square root of three times 13. Three and 13 can't be broken down anymore or you can't do anything with them. So to simplify those, it's best to just go ahead and multiply them back together. So three times 13 is 39. So the length for side B here is three square root 39. So again, one of our links here is an example of a time where the radicals or your answer doesn't work out to be a nice smooth whole number, but it's okay. And in this form, I would say is its most precise answer. Don't type that into a calculator and get a decimal and write it down as your answer unless that's what your directions tell you to do. If they say round to the nearest hundredths place, then okay, yeah, it sounds like they want you to write the um, radical portion as a decimal. But in my opinion, it's way more simplified, I guess you could say, to leave it as a radical. It's a more precise answer. It looks neater. It's not as messy as having like a really long decimal. And it is a true answer. Anything else would be like rounded or sort of estimated. Now let's take a recap. The Pythagorean theorem states that the square of the hypotenuse of a right triangle is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. You will need to use a radical as the inverse operation for the exponents to solve for the answer. The formula used when working with the Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. If you have a triangle that has two shorter lengths, a and b, and they are adjacent to a right angle, your opposite angle is your hypotenuse, and we usually label that as c. The a and b lengths are your legs, and your hypotenuse is your c length. Now you try, comment with the correct answer below. Look at this triangle and tell me what is the length of the hypotenuse. Once you've commented with your answer, head over to my website and click video answers if your answer is correct. Supereasymath.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Did you find this video helpful? You can support this channel by donating to Super Easy Math through PayPal. There's a link to it in the description section below this video and on the Super Easy Math YouTube cover photo.